Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the extra great stuff. This is the ebook series. And I am super happy to have ebook authors Miroslav Filipovich and Nick Toadhill with us today. Hello, Miroslav, and hello, Nick. Hey, hello. Hi. And Nick, where are you dialing in from? Dialing uh, in. Oh, boy, that dates in. me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, I'm zooming in from uh, from Sydney, uh, in uh, just in Australia near the uh, near the coast. Very cool. Miroslav, the same. I am also in Sydney, uh, but only about fifty kilometers west from uh, from Nick. Uh, I'm closer to the Australian, uh, well, closer to the mountains. Uh, uh, still, uh, uh, a big wave will kill me as well. So mm. not that far away. <laughs> Very cool. So let's see, we're in August. Uh, so here in the Northern Hemisphere, we are in the blaze of summer. Um, so you guys must be coming up on uh, the six months later season. So coming up uh, near the uh, onset of spring. Yeah. Well, we're still in the winter. Um, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's the uh, last couple of years, it's been extremely unusual weather in Australia, something that I haven't seen uh, in the past 30 years. Uh, and that's you know how long I've been living in Australia. Mm -hmm. It's a very wet uh, uh, through a, a year. It was a very wet summer, and uh, and the winter as well is very wet. So uh, we see a little bit of well, a very unusual weather uh, here. A lot of floods, especially around Sydney. Uh, we had uh, other sorts of uh, problems, uh, uh, weather like. Um, but hopefully, you know, things will improve uh, there as well. No climate change here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, well, maybe that's the part three of our um, astronomy and the climate change. Huh? Yeah, 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 three. Well, planets do evolve, you know, they do evolve. So it's very good. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're, it is August 17th, 2022, at least my August 17th, 2022 at 8 p.m. It is uh, Nick and Miloslav's uh, August 18th on Thursday uh, in the morning as we're shooting this. And yeah, Phoenix, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and it's full full summer. This is our wet season. So this is when we get our thunderstorms and our lightning and all that kind of stuff. So this is when the desert gets its uh, gets its rain. Um, otherwise, it is. Has the monsoon kicked in for you? The monsoons, very good. Um, and we get these uh, uh, big things called haboobs, uh, which are dust storms. They're big rolling dust storms. And so off, over a 25, 30 mile um, line, you will just get a very opaque wall, kind of red dust. It's kind of a red brown color. And it just rolls through like a big wave and everything gets a dust coating um, as you go through. So yes, it's our monsoon. It's our haboob season. Yep, very good. Ah, uh, you guys are authors of a pair of some very cool ebooks. So let's go ahead and take a look at those ebooks. And I'm going to do a full screen share. <clears throat> and very good. So we have Principles of Multi Messenger Astronomy and Multi Messenger Astronomy in Practice. Uh, and so I note the first one here on the left. This one was done in 2021. Yes, that was a publication date. Yeah, yep. December. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious, when did you, December, okay, uh, so when did you, when did you get the idea to do this ebook, and when did you start writing it, was that like in November of 2021, and so it took all the <laughs> uh, Well, the idea comes um, um, about a couple of decades ago, Ooh. Uh, okay. in the very beginning of my professional career, in late 90s, uh, mid to late 90s, um, I realized that uh, old-fashioned astronomy which is uh, a single frequency astronomy is not something that uh, we're gonna do in the future. And um, here at Western Sydney University, we opened the first internet master's degree and we really wanted to show um, our next generation students uh, how to do uh, this um, multi-frequency at the time astronomy. Mm -hmm. cool. And then I started developing the lecture notes uh, about all that and all the way through, I was very much convinced that this is the way you know, there is a niche, there is a, a, a need for a book, and then later on books uh, that will cover this very wide range of uh, astronomy that we are doing. So a couple of, couple of decades ago, yes, over a couple of decades ago, we started uh, developing uh, idea, developing notes, uh, experience, knowledge, everything else. <clears throat> and then uh, about five years ago, just uh, a couple of years before the COVID, um, we... Uh, uh, we'll sit together, two of us, and says, right, now we have uh, enough uh, knowledge and uh, lecture notes to turn this into a, a book. 
at the time at the book. And um, uh, one of your colleagues from uh, IOP um, visited us uh, and says, hello, you know, this is absolutely perfect. Let's do a book. Okay, good. Uh, and then uh, while uh, we were talking to you guys, uh, it became very clear that actually we have a materials for um, and ideas for two books. And there you go. Uh, two and a half decades later, we have a two fantastic, the best books uh, ever written in the history of this planet. So anyone who might be interested in writing an ebook out there, it might take you less than a couple of decades. You don't have to wait that long. <laughs> so, so I'm curious, are, are both you guys observers? Are you, you theorists or observers, one each? What's, what's, your, what's the makeup here? I'm an observer, and I'm sure that Nick will also say that he is observer. So okay. we are far more uh, connected to um, observational astronomy. Mm -hmm. Very good. And this is, you know, quite clear in the book. Uh, while we deal with the uh, with the theory in in the first book, uh, we're mainly focusing on the various methods uh, that we are using and the various practices uh, that we are using in a modern astronomy. Very cool. Very. Cool. And our methods. We are definitely doing observational methods. <clears throat> so if you're if you're hoping to learn how to do a um, a fluid dynamic simulation <clears throat> for beginners, you we don't have that. Unbook. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we may have we may have too many pages in our books, but we we weren't that crazy. So no, uh, we had to leave theory out. Did you have a uh, Nick? Did you have a target audience uh, in mind when you were writing these? Were these like undergraduates or graduate students, uh, researchers in practice, all of the above, something like that? Yeah, I would say it's it's all of the above okay. um, because we, um, I think, we have personal experience of students who come into research without having necessarily done a three or four year physics degree. Okay. And so, so the, obviously, we're interested in being able to bring those uh, bring those students up to speed. Right. Uh, right. Also, of course, there are you know undergraduates who um, who hopefully will be able to benefit from it at a more advanced level. But also, I also always had in mind some of those books that you always end up grabbing off your shelf mm -hmm. because they're the one that has that thing in it that you use all the time, which for some reason nobody else put in their book. I, uh, my ambition was always to make make that book, and I have no cool. idea if we've succeeded. Cool. Well, <laughs> well, you know, in about 10 years or so, so it'll be very we'll cool. We'll find out. <laughs> when somebody comes and asks you to sign their copy of it, you know, you made it. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and... Uh, let's Someone ahead. who's not my parents. No, oh, correct. <laughs> <laughs> Family and friends plan, yes. Lend those. Um, maybe, that, maybe I also can add, if you don't mind me, yeah. uh, I remember uh, all glory days when I was a postdoc uh, and the moving from one field of astronomy, radio astronomy, to a completely new field of astronomy to me at the time, X-ray astronomy, Okay. I was struggling to find, uh, um, uh, again, starting from the very beginning, like a PhD student, but I'm postdoc. And then it's not just X-ray astronomy, then it becomes gamma ray astronomy, then it becomes optical, and it becomes everything. And you know, you were struggling, you're unsure. Now, all I need is that book. One book, not 15 books, one for each energy range or particle type. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. Very cool. So let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, let's start off with principles, since that was the first one published. The second one here, which is much larger, 538 pages, uh, is a 2022 pub. So let's start off with principles. Uh, a little bit about the program itself, some of the people involved, multiples. I think one of the curious things about that is that although we got put into the purple category, so the uh, the uh, the fly leaves have the uh, have all the little categories. Uh -huh. I think we could actually easily have fit into the majority. There are about three there that we clearly don't fit into, and okay. all the rest we do something we, with. So, although I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm very happy with our purple, but uh, we could be anywhere else. Good, good. Uh, and that's a very lovely uh, dedication. So let people check that out. And Miroslav and Nick, take us away. So the way how we were uh, talking about the way why two books and what we're going to do in a book one and a book two, mm -hmm. we want uh, to see in a book one a bit more of a general uh, a background uh, for as a basic information, yeah. uh, a basic physics that Nick can 
uh, give you more examples um, through the book. Uh, but we want to make sure that at the very beginning, uh, um, everyone, whoever touches this book, understands the purpose of this book, and that is to cover a very wide range of um, uh, frequencies and the messengers there. And that's at the very beginning, we're going to introduce why and how is this significant. So that's where um, our uh, dream big uh, mm -hmm. starts uh, um, and uh, try to give you a, a review of a modern astronomy, uh, modern astronomy and the various wavelengths and the wa various uh, messengers. So that was the intention, you know, with the, with the first one, just to invite everyone. This is the reason why we're excited about this new approach uh, in, in our discipline, in our science. Cool. And then, Nick. Uh, yeah, so the um, so the after after we talked about kind of the uh, the historical telescope side of it, um, we uh, then then you pretty much have to start thinking about your actual messengers. So the um, so we then start talking about talking about well electromagnetic radiation. Although you know as a multi messenger book, we feel like we shouldn't priv over privilege electromagnetic radiation. The mm -hmm. fact remains that it is. It is still the thing that we reference everything to, possibly because we have electromagnetic sensors in our bodies. And so, you know, it's it's the first thing to uh, it is still the first thing to look at with apologies to all of our other messenger colleagues. Uh, so we just start off talking about light. And then, of course, that brings in everything else about electromagnetic radiation. Indeed. And so the, so this is, of course, a tricky one because um, we do have, you know, you know uh, optics constitutes several years of study. And even in an undergraduate degree, you're usually looking at, you know, at, at several months of solid work. And we can't we can't put that in. But we what we've tried to do is pick out the uh, the most important results, the most important principles and the things that are going to do the most work both in understanding astronomical electromagnetism, but also uh, the things that actually show up uh, and turn out to be important for other stuff too. Uh, yeah. For example, you need to understand polarization and some of the wave properties when you start thinking about gravitational waves because they mm -hmm. are still waves. Mm -hmm. So we've tried to pull that pull that together, and um, the and it's. And we've all we've it's a bit of a struggle to work out where to assume people are coming from. So we we have while we would expect most of the readers of this to have already done Maxwell's equations, okay. we can't be sure. So we put them in anyway because you know if you're coming into astrophysics from computer science, maybe you didn't do Maxwell's equations. Yeah. So at least you should see them. Indeed, very cool, very nice, super high summary, and then. You have some of the other measurements. Oh, you know, color. And paint. then we go to our next level, a modern level, uh, the messengers. Mm -hmm. We talk about uh, everything, uh, cosmic rays, neutrinos, and gravitational waves. But we want to talk about their physics uh, as well. They're in a chapter three. And uh, it's not just any more uh, old uh, fashioned traditional astronomy, uh, various frequencies, multi frequency. How are you going into something new and, and exciting? Uh, the new things in our discipline. And that is, once again, cosmic rays, uh, neutrinos, and gravitational waves. How all that merges uh, with a, with a, with a more, with our old-fashioned astronomy? How that you know, will tell us, uh, uh, give us uh, uh, more ideas uh, to uh, figure out what's going on uh, up there in the universe? Indeed. There's some of the measurements. <clears throat> and now <clears throat> that you've got this, uh, well, at least e and M, you got to propagate it. Got to get through, got to get here. And so we cover a little radiative transfer, it looks like. Yes, well, that's we've got... Nick? Yeah, uh, so that's that's essentially, this is one of those one of those odd ones where we suddenly realize that there are a whole load of different sections that sort of belong together, just to think about this, this mm. idea that, you know, what is, what happens as your electromagnetic radiation is going someplace. Because that often, that's something that we've often found um, tends to come in very much later, and um, and is introduced sort of as almost not as an afterthought, but once you've done all the other stuff, and uh, we're, and 
it's mm-hmm. certainly in my business, it's always been very important because I've worked a lot in things like the interstellar medium and dust clouds where actually it, radiative transfer is all you're looking at. Yes. So, uh, so it was something that we thought was important to bring up quite early. Mm. And, um, and then we had to, in sequencing everything, we realized we probably had to talk about it before we talk about the atmosphere because the atmosphere is simply a special case of all the stuff that goes wrong in space. A little denser, <laughs> but yes, awesome. So let's denser talk about... and more difficult. <clears throat> Indeed. So let's talk some of the difficulties of that Earth's atmosphere, correcting for that, moving it out of the way. Yeah, well, that's uh, chapter five was something uh, that we were always struggling. You know how to uh, how to get a, as best as possible, how to understand, how to improve uh, our observations given uh, this beautiful planet that we live in without destroying it, mm-hmm. and uh, we must have that chapter. This was the chapter with a lot of passion, you know, for a real old-fashioned astronomy <laughs> that we would like to do and, you know, tell the people, well, that's what's happening uh, up there. That's the reason why we see what we see. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, uh, I, I always love this chapter, uh, giving uh, a knowledge uh, uh, um, to our students, to anyone who reads the book uh, about uh, uh, influence of the Earth's atmosphere to mm-hmm. our observations, our ground observations. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it's it's one where it where a lot of stuff gets picked up because there are places where all of a sudden we're no longer just trying to be even-handed between electromagnetism and other things because cosmic rays um respond to the atmosphere as well so all of a sudden we are suddenly becoming quite implicitly multi-messenger um although neutrinos aren't overly troubled by it in, uh, and uh, and within within electromagnetic radiation you get a combination of both you know the turbulence which we traditionally worry about in optical and the transmission which we worry about in radio and infrared but actually the two of them come together and so you don't you want to treat them the, at the same time mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and although we do have space missions that, that get above this problem uh, there's still a tremendous amount of multi-messenger astronomy that has to go through the earth's atmosphere so yeah uh, okay, so now we've talked about what that radiation is, how are you going to transport it from object through space, through the atmosphere, and now we're going to talk about some, how do you make that irradiation? Yep. Yeah, of course, you know, that is a very important uh, for yeah. anyone reading the book to get the, the, the basic concepts uh, on uh, continuum emission, spectral line, and, uh, uh, we gave up, you know, even some pointers to uh, other other. Uh, readings and other references, um, we really want to uh, explain the basic uh, mechanisms uh, of emission. Uh, so uh, this is something that we work on a daily basis. Our students, our colleagues, we all the time talk about these things and just want to bring that into our book uh, in a simple form with uh, some examples uh, on the way how we're going to use that and what kind of instruments you need to uh, use to get to detect these emission mechanisms. Mm-hmm. That was a, another must-have uh, chapter. Oh, yeah. yeah. How you make it. Very cool. And then we make a little bit of a shift here, and we move over to the high-energy range and some of the particle stuff. Yeah, high energy is uh, uh, something uh, which is new. And uh, we really wanted to give an introduction here, a basic introduction here, when it comes down to um, uh, particle astrophysics. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, there's a... a astroparticle physics as well. So it's a, it was a little bit of a discussion about how we're going to name this chapter there. But the gamma rays, cosmic rays, and neutrino, that's our messenger. That's our new new messengers um, that we want to introduce here in its basics uh, uh, so that uh, the people can get the good grasp uh, knowledge uh, about what's happening here uh, with some uh, some examples on when and how we are using this without going into too much depth because that's what we're going to do in a book too and this is the place where where it really helps to be uh to be um to actually have multi-messenger in the title because if we actually started getting too uh too technical about about drawing distinctions, we would lose a lot because gamma rays and cosmic rays are so thoroughly intertwined that if you suddenly decide that, well, 
in yeah. this chapter, we're not going to cover gamma rays because they're electromagnetic radiation, after all, then you actually lose a lot. So yeah. we're able to... Uh, yeah. So we're able we're able to, uh, to take a multi messenger approach, which um, and that's that makes it much easier to understand what's going on. Yeah, they are not uh, they're not independent entities at some level. They are just coupling between some of these messengers, and that's a good thing. Very cool. And in the case of the new Cherenkov telescopes, half the time we detect cosmic rays through gamma rays anyway. So which one are you? Which field are you in? Yeah. Okay, you've picked my curiosity here. Uh, neutrinos from binary systems. What do you mean there? What is? Give me an example. Oh, binary stars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To start with, this is you know where we pick uh, a lot uh, the binary stars and the way how they interact. Uh, what kind of neutrinos uh, uh, shall we detect? That how are we going to detect? When are we going to detect all that? And what kind of physics are we going to get? Um, how is how that is connected to a supernova, which is a, a subchapter before uh, uh -huh. there, or and how we're going to observe it, uh, how we're going to detect these neutrinos. And we discussed uh, the basics uh, of that. So it's a binary stars is the mainly thing. This is you know one of the fascinating uh, objects uh, in the in the universe. And, uh, they are the neutrino targets. Okay, of targets for uh, detecting neutrinos. Cool. Well, now you've got my attention, so I'm going to have to read that section. <laughs> Very good. And then we go into high energy, and then we come to one of the famous ones in the last couple of years. Can I say that the gravitational waves, our chapter eight, was the, the main reason uh, when when we detected for the first time gravitational waves, uh, oh. I remember Nick and me talking, you know, on, uh, on a day after the uh, announcement of a detection, and then I think it was a very clear, we want a book now, we have the final thing. This is the final detected uh, <laughs> messenger, yeah. and now you know that's the that that was the missing link uh, a few years ago, uh, a couple of years ago when we detect this uh, uh, gravitational waves, and uh, uh, that was a, a a sign that we need to uh, uh, work on the now on a multi messengers. So there was uh, no excuse anymore uh, uh, not to uh, not to do uh, a complex multi messenger uh, science. Absolutely. Very cool. And the and the the actual now that gravitational waves have actually moved into the realm of astrophysics rather than very high end experimental physics, mm -hmm. then you know before mm -hmm. detection, really, if you were going to do if you were going to introduce somebody to gravitational waves, it really had to be based on the techniques or the theory, and would be very very detailed and would get very difficult very quickly. Um, and you would be doing a PhD in gravitational waves, uh, whereas now they've actually become an astrophysical phenomenon, and so there is a require, and so there is now a need for uh, for astronomers to understand, you know, enough about gravitational waves to be dangerous. Very good, well said. Without being a, without necessarily building their own, they're building their own LIGO. Uh, yeah, which is, or LVK, which or is hard. Or... <laughs> Takes a few dollars. <laughs> Very good. Cool. Ah, uh, okay. And now we've got all this, and now we got to put this on the sky. So we're going to have some uh, coordinate systems and stuff. Yeah. So then we wanted to go back back to the basic uh, at the end. Uh, going back to the basics means uh, we are observational astronomers, and uh, we want to tell uh, everyone just you know for a second in the last chapter. This is the way how the things work. This is the coordinates. Uh, this is the way the telescopes, uh, astrometry, photometry, because that's what we use every day. And we thought, you know, that the book without that will be really incomplete. So that's the reason why we must have this chapter. And of course, you know, the new uh, new astronomy, which is a data storage and access, and, uh, um, the way how we're using computers these days, uh, we mentioned that as well. We found that it is very important for this book just to put everything in the perspective. Oh, it's been uh, it's been revolutionary on data storage, access, processing. That's just been a huge boom. So. Very cool, and, then we, and got... we, uh, and we, we decided to put it at the back because it actually, although very often people teach astronomy with right ascension and declination up front, mm -hmm. and that's how I learned it. Mm -hmm. um, I generally, uh, I my general feeling is that it's better to explain to people why we might want to use these bizarre coordinate systems and at least get them interested in what we're trying to do with them before we uh before we hit them with uh with our angles and so on 
And that's and also, of course, part of the data storage element is that you need to understand Field. what you might be looking for and why you have this multidimensional data and then think about how you store it. Mm -hmm. So we felt we felt that the uh, the back of the book might be an eccentric place to put it, but we thought it was the right the right place to go. Yeah, very good. Bedrock, if you like, at the bottom. Very good. It's at the bottom. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, and remember, if your library subscribes, these are free people, so you can go grab a copy for free on Principles of Multi-Messenger Astronomy, the one you will be grabbing off your bookshelf for years to come. So we got to get Nick we his, his, we got to get his, Nick his signature. And then one year later, uh, we have Multi-Messenger Astronomy in Practice. So when you were putting, the, did you basically put these two together at the same time, and this one just came first or second, or did you start this one somewhat afterward? So we want the second book to be uh, as uh, update as possible. Okay. We wanted the latest astronomy, the latest discoveries to be here. So it was a uh, uh, the final product was uh, uh, probably a, a good six months uh, behind the first book. Uh, oh, okay. The really were The practice came mm -hmm. six months later, or uh, something like that in that order. But um, our uh, practice, uh, multi messenger astronomy in practice, that book, uh, the whole book, I think you know we've written. Uh, um, for the last 12 to 18 months. This is something very fresh, something very modern and the new, uh, yeah. almost out of the press. I'll give you an example. One of the big discoveries over the past uh, 12 months is uh, objects called orcs, or radio circles. You can read it in our book. So uh, uh, it's quite cool. Uh, it's okay. quite cool, you know, that we manage, you know, to put this latest uh, discoveries mm -hmm. uh, uh, throughout through every single chapter very nice very in our nice. book too but the the two the two volumes were designed kind of at the same time even though practice kind of trailed somewhat but sure. the idea to have it there was was right was pretty much baked in at the start because we knew that we once we once we'd started to think about the book it was pretty clear that you were going to we needed to abstract certain principles from it otherwise it would just get too too crazy and too you know there'd be too much stuff in it and you wouldn't be able to find the important things so if we pulled those out at the start and okay. then elaborate the way you actually do things and the way these principles are used in practice yeah. then that would be a nice way to go about it yeah. and then from there it just grew and grew and grew to 538 very cool yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I like I, I like the uh, the arrangement, the the strategy of splitting it off like this. This is great. So let's go ahead and get into a very topical and modern in practice. And you have a lot of co-authors uh, on this one. I just like these acknowledgments. So there we go. There it is again. Check it out, people. Very cool. And here we go on practice. A lot of co-authors in these sections. Yeah. So we wanted you know each of these chapters and sections. Uh, uh, to work with uh, the best of the best, the guys who really know the business. And uh, at the very beginning, we really want to give a, a whole overview of how the multi-messenger astronomy works uh, uh, with the different type of objects. So you can see this azul of objects uh, that we are examining uh, through all the messengers. Uh, and they give it a, a big overview and introductions and, and invitations uh, to everyone that's the way. That's the way of the future, for the, in the future of uh, of uh, of our discipline. Um, we spend uh, quite a lot of time developing the concepts here, understanding this is the knowledge of the whole astronomy, observational astronomy, very wide. As I said, from the multi wavelength astronomy to the multi messenger astronomy, and putting this together is a quite big challenge uh, for us. Uh, uh, at the one uh, at the one side, you know, we we knew the concept as Nick just explained, but we wanted to be uh, very much up to date. The last second we were changing uh, uh, things, adding not changing actually, adding a new discoveries because for the last uh, few years, guys, you know, everyone knows, everyone who works in uh, in, in astronomy uh, knows that there's a quite a lot of new discoveries, and we really wanted to cover as many as possible. And the new was uh, new discoveries are coming every day. That's the exciting part. Yeah, it's a 
Great. Unfortunately, a lot of chapter one is probably already uh, already a little right. behind. Always. Um, right. <laughs> always. I'm sure our fast radio burst section needs updating. <laughs> And uh, I will come back to that at the end. <laughs> very cool. But uh, a very topical at the time, very broad overview. And probably 99% of it is still very valid. Um, okay, then we go into the long wavelengths from radio to terahertz. And we pick up... So Nick and, Nick and I are radio astronomers. And uh, as a radio astronomers, this was a, a chapter which was very close to uh, two of us. Yeah, so and we really, really want to work... Uh, with a couple of other colleagues, with Natasha and Jeff, uh, mm. uh, to uh, give a, a full uh, um, a brief of uh, modern radio astronomy with the new telescopes, uh, yeah. uh, uh, precursors, uh, uh, the one, uh, the two telescopes in Australia, NWA, yes, uh, and and ASCAP, and then Meerkat in in South Africa. We have a northern telescopes uh, uh, like ALOFA and GVLA, um, and. Uh, this was the, something very exciting, you know, for us to bring this uh, latest uh, of the new generation of radio telescopes and uh, show through uh, what we can do with all, with all of them. Very nice. Very nice. We want to be a very much practical uh, in all these chapters, practical uh, for, uh, for astronomers, for colleagues to understand what is possible in this, uh, in, in this wavelength, in this uh, radio wavelength what kind of things you can do so that they can immediately have a look right. You know, uh, I'm X-ray astronomer, so that means, you know, my pet objects, you know, can I see them in uh, in radio astronomy? All right, let's have a look at uh, Nixon Miroslav book, you know, and uh, what I can learn there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and you can see a very strong kind of um, even instrumentation bias in that we, uh, our split between chapters two and three is based actually on observing physics rather than wavelength because we actually we were <clears throat> we were kind of at one point we were sitting uh we were sitting in in Miroslav's office next to the whiteboard trying to work out where we would split from between radio and infrared and what happened I'm by background I'm mainly a millimeter and submillimeter astronomer which is always interesting and so in the end we decided to to lump the Submillimeter bolometer work with the infrared okay. and uh, as as incoherent detection where you're just really measuring how much energy there is and then okay. the uh, sub and then millimeter and submillimeter coherent detection with mixers could go with radio astronomy so yeah. which I think is a slightly unusual way to divide it up but mm -hmm. we think it works yeah. or at least we were able to convince our 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 authors to do it that way uh huh no no it, uh... It's different. That's a good thing. Puts it takes a different angle on it, and that's can be very useful. I like this. Very good. Very One of good. ideas uh, in in this book was to uh, give a a world overview, world overview in terms of our co-authors, uh, the guys who uh, uh, wrote all these chapters are actually you know the best. Not important where are they coming from. So Michelle is from South Africa at the moment in Australia. Tom mm -hmm. is from US. Um, and you will see the other authors, they are all around the world. So the astronomy doesn't have a, a, a borders, you know, we work all together. Right. And that was a, one of the messages that we want to uh, send. Sam, Sebastian, uh, in the next chapter, chapter four, is from Argentina. He's one of the, the leading right. Argentinian astronomers there. And uh, Seb did a phenomenal job uh, uh, with uh, giving uh, a very good uh, 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 points in in a visual and near near infrared astronomy. Again, Nick just explained what is the red line between uh, one wavelength and wavelength and another it was always a little bit you know uh, something to uh, to work with. But uh, we really want to you know show the uh, what's the latest there. And uh, uh, Dennis from Canada um, worked on ult uh, ultra wide yes. astronomy. Yes. Yes. Uh, Dennis is a you know well known um, uh, astronomer from Canada. Yeah. Uh, did a phenomenal job giving us, reminding us what kind of things we can do without uh, ultraviolet astronomy, which I was very proud to see. Uh, yeah. And the old glory days of a Voyager <clears throat> and the Galax and other other instruments that he is covering there, and what kind of science actually are applicable in ultraviolet astronomy. Yeah, we got an HST, very cool, and then we keep cranking up the energy. Okay. And Pierre, X-ray astronomy. Well, uh, now we are coming to a couple of chapters. Uh, 
well, actually all chapters, but this is a very thorough chapter by our French colleague, Pierre, uh, from uh, uh, Strasbourg University and Observatory Day. Mm -hmm. uh, Pierre does this in his own French fashion, uh, uh, really going uh, every single word. There is a meaning there. Everything is covered. There is nothing that we miss in this chapter. I would be very surprised to see if it's anything missing uh, there. It's a huge, it's a massive chapter. It's yeah. what, you know, over 55 pages, you know, it, it could be a book for itself. The same way, the next chapter, uh, Gavin, our great colleague from uh, Adelaide University, oh, oh, look at that, 64 pages there. It's a book for itself. <laughs> uh, it's a complete brief about the gamma ray astronomy. Uh, um, everything that is happening uh, over the last, uh, you know, a uh, few years, especially, you know, what kind of objects. Have a look, 7.5.6 pevatrons. You know, this is something that is, yes. a, you know, uh, very exciting, these type of uh, objects, which are extreme accelerators in, in, in our uh, Milky Way. Um, we, we still, you know, trying to figure out what is that. And Gavin did a phenomenal job here explaining the details uh, of the of the of, of, of gamma rays and gamma ray astronomy. Yes, I would say uh, Pevatron mechanisms are a very popular submission these days down the high energy corridor. So, yes, <laughs> I, yes, it is. <laughs> Very good, very good. And then we move into sort of the particles with Clancy and neutrinos. Yeah, Clancy, very talented young uh, astronomer from Western Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I would say uh, uh, world, uh, uh, world renowned uh, uh, neutrino astronomer with a huge amount of experience, especially with the instrument called the KM3 net. This yeah. is one of the, the main instruments that we are building uh, 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 just the south from the uh, um, Italy, in, in the Mediterranean coast, Italy and France. Uh, yeah. um, and interesting thing is that uh, they're going to actually observe the southern sky because they're going to use the Earth as a filter. And uh, Clancy is uh, one of the main collaborators uh, uh, working in this area specifically and put a lot of experience into a number of new generation of objects. Have a look, 8.4.7, Blazer, uh, TXS, uh, 0506 plus 05. Yep. Six, uh, you know, it, it was absolutely phenomenal to see this one of the, the most exciting objects uh, uh, brought through this neutrino astronomy. And then, what's the future? You know, how are we gonna deal with the uh, with uh, with uh, with, uh, with the future detections in neutrino astronomy? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was uh, Ice Cube on that one. Oh yes, yeah. Ice Cube as well, of course. Yep, yep. Very nice neutrinos, and then another messenger, GW, with Paul. Yeah, Paul. Paul is our great colleague from uh, from Melbourne, um, and again, this is a book for itself. It was approved among the, the big uh, uh, gravitational uh, wave astronomy before it was uh, uh, approved uh, for uh, IOP um, right. a publication. And as you can see, it's a very very thorough review on what you can do with the gravitational wave astronomy. And, uh, and the future of gravitational wave astronomy. We're also very, very proud of this uh, this chapter. As you can see, 60 pages, it's a book yeah. for itself. Yeah, I, I, I have to admire your ability to herd cats and get this many people <laughs> writing this depth <laughs> of section. So I admire your persuasive powers to be on time. <laughs> I, it was uh, you know, not easy to uh, put all these things together, of course. I bet not. Very good. And then the dark stuff. Yeah, the dark stuff is uh, uh, our colleague from Hungary, Chaba, Chaba Balas, who works in Melbourne uh, uh, at the moment, uh, Monash University. He is a great uh, uh, a theoretician uh, uh, and working in this area. And we love this chapter. We have to have this chapter. And the Chaba did a phenomenal job here, staying you know, the simplest way how this you know, will be a part of the whole book idea how this sits, so it was a melting perfectly. Uh, now, no one should compare his 19 pages with the 64 pages of, uh, uh, of, of Gavin Rowell in Gamma Ray Astronomy. It's just a perfect melt. We didn't want to repeat any of these things uh, in between the chapters, we just want to refer that. So uh, we love Chaba and the Chaba, uh, the way how he writes uh, these things was a simple on the point, you know, and, uh, and, and, and the number of good, uh, good ideas for the future. Yeah, you actually bring up an interesting point when you have this many co-authors and was was there uh, some sort of an attempt to 
make the whole book speak with a single voice? Did you go through and do an editing over to sort of get a single voice or does each chapter have its own voice? Yeah, we spend a, a, a lot of time trying to uh, give a freedom on one side to each uh, for each chapter. Yeah. But I really wanted you know, to make sure that the chapters between themselves are talking to each other. So yeah. Gavin talks a lot with the Clancy. Gavin, who writes the Gamma Rays, and the Clancy, who writes the Neutrinos. Great. It's closely. And then we talk to uh, Pierre. So both Nick and, and myself were really coordinating all this uh, uh, and trying to make sure that this is all fits. You know, and and uh, as a one book, even though it's a lot of us are writing this book. Indeed. We okay. needed to, I think the important thing was to make sure that all the authors were, were, um, not so much speaking with the same voice, but uh, but working with the same purpose. Okay. So, for example, you see in in the radio chapter in uh, chapter two, um, one of the one of the approaches taken is actually to think about how do you write a proposal for a radio telescope. Mm. Now, that's something that is less relevant to giant multi collaboration as multi institution astroparticle collaborations where you're probably not going to be doing that but it still has the same idea that what happens when somebody comes in either because they're new to astronomy or they're new to this kind of astronomy you know how do you how do you how do you start them going and this chapter takes the approach well how would you write a proposal which is uh not something that's done in the other chapters yeah. So in some ways it has a different voice, but it is absolutely Integrate. doing the same thing, trying to work with the same audience to get them to the same place. Got it. Very good. Given the uh, breadth of this, that makes a lot of sense. And then we come into, of course, things that motivates many, huh. SETI. Exactly. You just said the things that motivates many. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's, that's exactly question, the right? without... <laughs> the book without the SETI, hello, you know, um, the origin of life. You, know, yeah, you must have that, you know, how all these messengers, how are we going to uh, 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 relate that to all that? And that was a, something I enjoy every single minute, uh, co-writing uh, with Bana and Milan, mm -hmm. uh, who are leading experts in, in this field, observational multi-messenger SETI and techniques, what we can do, all crazy ideas. Look, we are now again talking about fast radio bursts, but in a, as a SETI messengers, are they, could they be a SETI messengers? So we're really exploring all sorts of ideas here yep. uh, of the multi messengers uh, in, a, in, in a SETI. It's origin of life, origin of the universe. One might hope that one's SETI is in fact multi messenger. So it's great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> SETI is a multi messenger, it's the best example. Exactly. So what kind of book this would be without the setting? Uh, incomplete. Incomplete. <laughs> Absolutely. So now it's complete. And then, oh, we get into some real practical stuff with Ray on data science and mining and machine learning and AI and all that good stuff. Oh, boy. Ray Norris is our next door colleague. He's one of the legend in a, in a, in a field of astronomy. Mm. And uh, as you can see, uh, this is a, a, a several decades of experience of um, of Ray working uh, in a various fields of astronomy. Wow. Uh, uh, the latest one is machine learning, and uh, all these discoveries, how we see this with uh, the latest generation of the technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ray uh, and his experience really speaks out here very clearly. Nice. Nice. Nice way to end off the uh, pragmatics there. And there we go. That is quite a span, I have to say, on this book. You don't see many books with that kind of a span. So um, congratulations. <laughs> That's really awesome. Thank you. Really awesome. <laughs> we are certainly, uh, I would say, I have learned a lot um, because it turns out that there were, I suddenly found out that there were huge parts of astronomy and astrophysics that I'd kind of brushed under the carpet a little bit. Uh -huh. And uh, suddenly suddenly i had to i had to pull them out so it was um it was uh, it was it was it was great great learning as well as uh, as well as writing yeah very cool uh, if you don't mind me uh nick says about the learning i need to give you a, a small anecdote too during the process of writing one of the chapters and please you know find yourself that chapter i come uh, across the very famous russian scientist uh, uh with name andrei komogorov sure 
And I discovered that uh, a good four decades ago, I was his student. At that time, you know, I was not pay paying uh, a good attention, you know, to his lectures. And finally, now 35, 40 years later, wow. you know, I'm writing using the notes from 40 years ago that I was listening to his lecture. That was absolutely, you know, hilarious, you know, for me as a as a small anecdote. Uh, finally, I've learned, you know, what he meant there. And uh, <laughs> uh, since then, since then, you know, he is uh, one of the legends uh, in uh, in uh, in in the field. Indeed, indeed. Wow, that's wild. You took uh, Komogorov's course. That's awesome. Um, so I got to ask in particular, since, uh, volume two there in practice is, is very, um, topical, uh, and like anything that, where you write something very topical, as Nick noted, as soon as you publish it, it's kind of out of date. Um, so I got to ask, is there going to be a volume three? <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Silence everywhere. <laughs> uh, answer? Probably not. <laughs> no, no, I don't mind. Uh, I don't mind saying this, um, um, I remember uh, a couple of colleagues and friends asked me, you know, when is going to be a, the part three, when it's going to, you know, you're going to do updates and all that. Mm -hmm. At the time when we finished the book, uh, I said, uh, look, um, you know, I don't want to hear, I don't want to write any book anymore in my life. And a good colleague of mine told me, yes, that's what I did, you know, with my, after my first and second book. Uh, yeah. And then the third book, you know, I completely, you know, so it looks like, you know, we need some time to uh, relax. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. To be yeah. honest, I can see a part three right now, but I'm not going to write it now. Okay, <laughs> just give us a little bit more time. I can see a part three coming soon. I, I wonder if they have. I wonder. Uh, I wonder if they do like living textbooks, like you know, you just update parts of it uh, as opposed to taking on the whole thing again. Um, anyway, I'm just throwing. Well, that. that is part of the part of the promise of a, of doing something as an ebook. Although I'm not sure how oh. how libraries would <laughs> feel about buying a print copy and then finding that. It had changed under them, but um, but the possibility of being able to actually update it in real time, yeah. um, whenever you find when something new crops up, um, is an is a very interesting one. But um, but at the moment, I think we're still we're still recovering. So no, uh, it's perfectly fine. I, I just <clears throat> I think those two books are awesome together. I really do. I think those are. I think you're probably going to hit your. Uh, uh, nail on the head as far as being the one book that you're going to grab off the shelf when you want to do MMA. So um, it's very cool. Congra congratulations. It's really cool. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think um, we had, I think we've had a very good, had a very, a very interesting time to do this because this is probably about the last time that you'll be able to write a book with this kind of topic in this few pages. So um, okay. the next <laughs> The next step is going to either need it to be even bigger or it's going to have to be done by somebody with very good editing skills, uh -huh. because I think we may have reached this. We may have reached our limits of being able to throw things out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Once again, guys, this is a huge challenge to write a book like this book. It's not just the knowledge, it's time. You know, we have a young family, both of us. Uh, and so a lot of dedications, a lot of hard work, a lot of, you know, discussion with other colleagues and, you know, make sure that this is the latest up to date. Uh, it's, it's, it's a huge task. It's rewarding. This is something that all your life, uh, you think, you know, I would easily say this is one of my personally biggest accomplishments, these couple of books. Very cool. Very cool. It's, it's, I, I, it's a great, you know, part for, uh, for uh, each of our careers. And future generations will pick this Absolutely, up. Absolutely, yes. Right? We all know those classic textbooks, that, and hopefully this will. Help. Side. It's one of the first, too, right? I mean, that's the other advantage that have. You can only be, you know, among the first early on. So this is a real early rendition of it. So I, you've done a remarkable job putting us all this together. So very cool. Thanks, Miroslav. Thank Nick, thank you so much for talking to us about your really lovely ebooks, and that will do. Thank you. And it was everybody, a pleasure. Wow, well, thank you. I'm down under or up top. Of you. <laughs> and everyone, I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. Go out and grab a couple of copies, and we will see you on the next one. Thanks. Bye bye.